The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and hello and welcome again, everybody, to another exciting adventure of As We See It. This is show number 35, being recorded on Sunday, March 25th, 2012. And we have our usual original cast of characters here with us today from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Ed Jupin. Out there in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, we have Fred Boaz. In St. Louis, Missouri, we have Holly Hurley. And in Brookline, Massachusetts, The Lobster. Hello, guys. Well, hello. Hey. Hey, guys. Hey, good evening, everyone. Or afternoon. So, so uh, Fred, I think our first story today gives a whole new meaning to wear your helmet. Oh, no, 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 it really, really does. And it comes out of a, an article from uh, a thing called officer.com. It's local. It's actually not that local. It comes out of Belgrove, Pennsylvania. But something I thought was interesting that a, a helmet, in Pennsylvania, we don't have SWAT teams, per se. We have something called CERT teams. And I'm not sure what the SERT stands for, but special, I guess, emergency response teams would be, would be best guess on that. And that's through the uh, Pennsylvania State Police. A helmet saved a state trooper's life uh, when he was shot in the head during a standoff in Belgrove. And this took place last uh, Tuesday, about 7 p.m. Believe it or not, they were going to serve a uh, paper for to have a guy evaluated for a gentleman by the name of Samuel Lee Snyder. They were going to serve him with paperwork to have him evaluated for mental health stability. And he fired 40 or 50 rounds. Uh, at the CERT team in Belgrove. The initial answer to the gunfire, they said there were approximately 30 troopers that were in a direct line of Mr. Snyder's weapons. The bullet went in about an inch below the ch uh, above the chin strap and saved his life. So, you know, good. I mean, we, 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 we hope the trooper's doing fine, and of course, the suspect this was killed by the troopers. But it goes to show you that helmets are not only good for motorcycles, but they're also good for bullets. And Pennsylvania, by the way, is the last state that, had, that does not have helmet laws for motorcycles. So, figure that one out. Well, I just like to say, I mean, Belgrave, Pennsylvania, you don't hear about this kind of thing happening there. I mean, they had to send in, you know, the special emergency team. This guy was just firing off rounds at people. Apparently, he was crazy because, you know, his son had just died and he's just lost all will to live. So he just decided to just shoot him up. I mean, I, 50 rounds? Like, how does a guy get 50 rounds off on the police? Like, this is just unbelievable. Well, you have to remember the, uh, the SCRT teams are going to do everything they can to avoid firing at this guy until the last minute. So it's possible yeah, they, to get up to 50 yeah. rounds. But, but yeah, the thing is, so, was, this, was this actually firing them or was this uh, suicide by cop? Yeah, I think I think you may be right. I think it may have been I think it may have been suicide by cop, but I just feel like I mean eventually they had to call in a sniper to shoot the guy because everybody was in so much danger. Just like it, it just is amazing to me. Felt like he was he said he felt like he was justified in doing this and harming them if they came to his residence and I just I don't understand at what point you have the right to kill someone else's son, father, or brother because you're you lost yours. This guy just, I mean, he must have been just off his rocker. I don't know. That's just, that's crazy. And you just don't think about that kind of thing happening in Belgrave, Pennsylvania. You know, they took him to Hershey Medical Center. I just, I find that crazy. Guy snapped, and I understand. But they didn't serve him paperwork to have him mentally evaluated, and the guy got himself killed. And you got to think that he had to know why they were there, because they, they always announced it. They announced why they were there. But this guy... He was looking for a way out, and they gave it to him. He what, didn't have the didn't have the chutzpah or the balls to do it himself, so he had the cops do it. Well, you know, he actually uh, they found an armed hand grenade next to him when they came to ex dispose of his body too. I mean, this guy was just he would really had a death wish. I think you've got it right on the head there, Fred. Just obviously, completely bananas. <laughs> this is terrible. I feel bad for the cops in this situation. Yep. You know, I mean, being called in and that's just yeah. Thanks. Well, that, that's interesting, so wear your helmets, kids. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually kind of incensed over, uh, over this next story, Fred. A kid went in for a job interview and got asked for his Facebook 
password? They wanted not they were for an interview and they want apparently from what I understand that they were asking him for they asked him for his Facebook password because they wanted to get into his Facebook page and see what he had posted as to whether it fit the profile of the company. Where do we stop and where do we say, hey, privacy issues are privacy? What you put on Facebook, some people put a lot of crap on Facebook that they don't believe. They, and I know a guy that got booted from an organization because of what he put on, rightfully or wrongfully. I'm not giving my Facebook password to anybody. So, you know, it, it's nobody's business. I mean, you got people who are defending this issue. The ACLU was complaining about it. You know, it's still, it's still an invasion. It, it may not be a violation of your privacy, but it's still invasive, and it just leaves me with, and personally it leaves me with a bad taste in my mouth. So I, I don't even want to be. I, I think the, 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 the employer should be admonished. They should be fined. There should be a law. You can't do this kind of stuff, but that's not the way we're heading, so. No, I actually absolutely agree. I think it's one thing, you know, for an employer to go on your Facebook. Like, it, I need to clean mine up, actually, because I just got back from my trip to China, and everybody's posting all of these pictures at me, you know, a karaoke with a beer in my hand, and these are things you don't want future employers to see. So you have to then go in and clean up your Facebook and make sure the things that should stay between you and your friends or between you and your friends. And there's a whole reason why, you know, Facebook has settings, because it's just like you wouldn't, per se, talk about your employers about, like, all the details of a certain surgery that you've had. You're also not going to want them going on your Facebook and seeing what you did at the lake last Friday. It's none of the, it's none of their business and honestly has nothing to do with your work performance. And, I, you know, maybe there's a, maybe you could make an argument for a gray area in the case of, like, the CIA or the FBI, but they're going to find those things anyway, quite frankly. Or, you know, the police, now the police, uh, many police organizations have taken this on. And I understand if you're a police organization and you've got someone who's going to, say, be saving kids, that you want to make sure that they don't have any unsavory habits. But you still shouldn't have to give people your Facebook. You know, you shouldn't have to give them your login. That, to me, is just ridiculous, super invasive, and completely unconstitutional, I think. And more, worse than that, I mean, it, then they, uh, then there, there was an argument that, well, okay, maybe I'll log in and you won't see my password. Once I'm, lo once you're logged in, or once I'm logged in, you have access to everything I have. You have access to my page, access to what I'm doing. You can go in. I mean, there's no telling that your computer, and it happens. That p compute, p computers keep keystrokes. We all know this. Most company computers keep keystrokes. You can now go in, have your IT department go in, you can find my password to the keystrokes that I typed into your computer. You can't tell me, well, we're not going to use it. Come on. You go in after I'm done, you can go in, you, and you don't know what other people are going to put into your uh, page. So, first of all, Facebook is a fantasy world anyway. It's a social media site, not meant to be the real world. It's meant to be a, f a fantasy world that people can, 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 can post what they want, and it, you're anonymous doing this. And you know something? I want, people, I want people to stay away from this one. Well, and here's, I mean, you know, I, I would make the argument that the point of Facebook is actually to connect with people you already know that in this day and age, because everybody's so global, sometimes it's difficult that people aren't going to be at the same phone number for 20 years like they were in, say, the 50s. This is a much better way to connect with the people in a global society and maybe people that you want to check in every now and again, but not necessarily somebody that you're going to call on the phone every day. You know, and I, I think it's a great thing about Facebook that you can connect with people that you've known in all parts of your life and all parts of the world. So I think it is real life, but I still think that there's a reason for the privacy settings, and there are certain things that should not be any business of your employers. You know, there is a certain boundary, even though in certain lines of work it is, it's highly blurred, there is a certain boundary between business and private, and I don't think they have any right to ask for your password or to have you log in on their computers, because as you said, I wouldn't log into my Facebook in a, most work environments. I mean, there are exceptions, maybe for a second, or like if I'm working on a project where I need to gauge some social media information, maybe I'll log into my Facebook, but for the most part, I stay off my Facebook at work in the first place, because I those computers are not your home computer. They're not your own computer computer and you don't want them to have access to your private information. It's just, I just think it's complete bollocks to allow it to go on. I, I don't agree with it at all. And I know that some of the courts have said they're not going to touch it with a 10-foot pole. 
And I think there is a certain point where, you know, one of the quotes from the article that we read that AP put out is that this is, uh, what did she say exactly? She said it's coercion. If you need a job and someone asks you to volunteer your password, I mean, you know, people with kids, especially, you're talking about feeding your family, and a job is the difference between paying your bills and not paying your bills or feeding your family and not feeding your family. It is coercion to ask for this in the, under this uh, particular duress, and I don't really think it, it should be at all a policy that should I think it should be illegal. I don't think it should be legal at all. And the thing is, this wasn't even his job. He was into this kid, Justin Bassett, who came out was in Seattle where this occurred, was being yeah. interviewed for a new job and he expected of course he expected the usual question about experience reference and then like it says here, he was astonished when they asked him for it. Now Yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't even bother I would have got up and walked out. Yeah, he, well, he, that's what he did. But, yeah. you know, there are some people in this article that said that they gave it for the reasons that I talked about. You need a job. Applying for a job, if you ask someone for this under the circumstance where in this particular financial climate, people are out of work. They may have been out of work for a long time. This Getting this job position can be the difference in paying their bills and not paying their bills. And I think it's coercion to ask someone for their password under this situation because if you have a lot of people said they gave it because they needed the job you need to feed your kids you have to pay your bills you don't want your mortgage going under I certainly hope that when these people went home they went in the first thing they did they changed their Facebook passwords because once they have it I mean you don't know if this person's writing it down after he gets it and he's going in later on to see if you change what you know I would just immediately change my password but this I mean this is gonna hit the courts this is going to hit the courts, and it is going to hit the courts big. There are going to be lawsuits on this. There are going to be the lawsuits are going to mean to the tens, or if not hundreds of millions of dollars on this. But this is a privacy issue. There is not an employer out there that can justify it. I'm sorry. I, I mean, we've been we've been employ, employ people here at BaseNet. I've employed people in my in my. I wouldn't even think of asking somebody coming for a job for their Facebook. I, I mean, the, the thought would never even cross my mind before I read this article. I would love to see one of those commercials on TV for the lawyers. Did you did you get uh, asked for your Facebook interview uh, for your Facebook paperwork for an interview? Call us. We'll sue them. I mean, it's going to happen, and it's going to be big. This is going to go. And I'm telling you, I got. I I, I have no doubt these employers are going to lose. Well, I hope so. But to be honest with you, we're in a day and age where the internet's changing everything and we're going to have more of these kinds of conversations because it there's not legislation for this yet because so many of this stuff didn't exist 10 years ago but there should oh, yeah. be so i guess we'll we'll look out for that and keep reporting on that as it comes in okay so now explain this next story to me uh that happened we have a judge who they're blocking they're how is this that they're blocking off future appeals in a case in knoxville how did, well, how, how, well how did it's, more, it's more, but that's really not why I posted the story. I gave you part of the story. I gave you the back end of it. What happened to the guy, it, a, a group of people, the, the reason this was posted is that nobody's heard the story. Now, we, we all heard the story about, um, about Trayvon Martin, the kid who got shot by the white guy uh, who, because the kid was wearing a hoodie. I have no problem with that, and I mean, I have no problem with people being outraged by that. But this story goes on that five people who happen to be black attacked a couple, viciously attacked them, and viciously the the man, the boy, the the young man, black this group of five black people that were in there tortured these people. They cut off the young man's penis, set him on fire, and then shot him. And I don't see this on HLN with Joan Velez Mitchell or James Velez Mitchell. I don't see the, the outrage of people on this. I see the outrage though, of, a, of a young black man being shot by a white guy who's an idiot. And I believe that that outrage should be there. I'm not saying it shouldn't. I, I see the outrage. It should be there. We, there. There are hoodie protests all over the country. And those belong there. What the guy did was outrageous. He should not be pinned. And the guy should go to jail for first degree murder and a whole bit. But where's the outrage with these two kids? being attacked by these five black people, we hear nothing about it because the press isn't covering it. And now the, the judge wants to block appeals. Because, you know, I mean, they, 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 they have the right to appeals, which is fine. But you can only do so many appeals. I mean, they want to stay off new trials in the case of Knoxville, most hero uh, one of the most horrific crimes. I mean, this is just unbelievable to me. But what's more unbelievable about the mainstream media would never cover this story. It's not on TV. We don't have 16, 17 days worth of coverage on this. But we have it for something else, and that's just wrong. And it's going to show, show the double standards out there from the mainstream media, that's all. 
No, I completely agree. When I worked at for CNN, I would always be just aghast because you, we could see the feeds from around the world all the time. And I was in a pretty low-end position, and you're watching this news take hold in the rest of the world. And at the time I was working at CNN, for however you feel about it, we were covering Terry Schiavo 24 hours a day. And I'm watching these videos of wars going on, of Americans being slain abroad, of things happening that would just blow your mind all over our country. And we were just covering Terry Schiavo 14 hours a day. And that story was covered. Nothing changed from day to day for weeks, you know. And it's one thing to report on it. It's another thing to let it rule the air and not have anything in between. But the truth is, these news networks are in the middle of a ratings battle. They're not covering the news that matters anymore. They're covering the news that will get that people People are already sensationalizing. They're covering the news that will get them the big numbers. Well, I have to cut in for a second. The reason that BaseNet TV is here today is because of ter the Terry Schiavo case and examples similar to what you just gave about CNN and mainstream media. We formed the predecessor to, not the predecessor to BaseNet, but we started a new division within that predecessor company, which led uh, ultimately to BaseNet Television because of mainstream media ignoring other major stories that were taking place at the same time as the Terry Schiavo case. And because of that, we started our program After Dark, which was originated to not cover, as you know, Holly, as being a former host of After Dark, not talking about the stories that everybody else was talking about. As a matter of fact, that was one of our taglines, and we would look into other stories. So it's ironic that you bring up the Terry Schiavo case in CNN and mainstream media. I think if it wasn't for the Terry Schiavo case, we wouldn't be here right now more than likely even having this discussion on this program and on this network. And as a matter of fact, we are very shortly going to be bringing back After Dark in its original format as an alternative to mainstream media news. I just had to let our listeners know that haven't been following BaseNet from the beginning, that that's why we're here, because of that particular case. We're also here because, you know, it, adding into that, we're not taking sides, I mean, I'm not taking sides on this issue. Um, you know, again, like I said at the beginning of what I was saying, I posted this article and sent this out for the show tonight because it outrages me that no one's outraged about these, about these two young people who were killed. Christian and Newsom were killed. And I understand the outrage, again, like I said about, about Trayvon Mar uh, uh, Martin. I understand the outrage, and I agree with it 100%. You know, I'm as outraged, but what happened? You got, you know, the other side of it was, you know, the, uh, Trayvon Martin's killed by a white guy. Okay, fine. You know, it happens. You know, it is what it is, and it, you know, there's no excuse for it. The black community and the white community should both be outraged what this man did for the reason he did it. But where's the outrage when, when these two kids are killed by five black people? There's not even coverage on this except the local news in Knoxville. Again, this is one of the uh, a type of after dark story that we'd be covering. But, I mean, this is just something that outrages me that the mainstream media isn't there. There isn't the outrage. There aren't the protests. They, aren't, they don't have a, a, a Christian Newsom day and parade and all this good stuff. And yet they have hoodie out. You know, people wearing hoodies because they want to protest what happens again. And they should. We have no out. I don't see. I don't see Jesse Jacks, Al Sharpton as outrage about that these two young people were tortured, as I do about a kid being shot because we were in a hoodie. Yeah, I. I mean, that I. I agree with you, and I just think. I just think it's unfortunate, but it's true that that one of the reasons that I think the the internet phase and the you know people like us are important. Not to say that we're the best out there, but hey, if people can cover the news like they want to online at any time of the day, and people can get the truth of things, this was Ted Turner's original goal for CNN was that the news that matter would be covered because there'd be something on 24 hours a day to catch what's happening. The internet gives us that. And I'm hoping that we're entering into a new era in which people can find out about stuff like this and get outraged about it on their own. They won't need Fox News to tell them what to think. Going from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, you went out and saw Hunger Games last Friday, huh? I did. I did. And actually, um, I, I hate to do this, but I think before we get into it, we skipped a very important part of our show today. We missed our lobster tail segment. We haven't even had our lobster tails. Uh, we we okay, can't go on without our that. lobster. I can well, let's go, go do that. that. I love uh, melted butter, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get out your bibs, everybody. When did that start? <laughs> 
<sighs> you there, lobster? I'm here, and here goes. Number one, there are 10 million bricks in the Empire State Building. Number two, a crocodile always grows new teeth to replace the old teeth. Number three, the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, uses every letter of the alphabet. Number four, the mint once considered using donut-shaped coins. Okay, Ed, tell us about the Empire State Building. Hmm. Uh, did, didn't we have a debunking of that over the week, during the week? Yeah, apparently so. If anybody knows any differently, please write in to awsi at basenettv.com or follow us on our social media sites on Facebook, Twitter, Google+. I had seemed to have remembered that when the Empire State Building was built in the 1930s, it was very unique in its construction because it was the first or one of the first with a steel skeleton and then encased in concrete. So it was steel and concrete. We went to the Book of Knowledge and to a couple of other sites and none of those sites mentioned bricks at all. Not in any way, shape, or form was there any mention of bricks. It just spoke in more detail about the fact how there was this unique to the time construction of steel, skeleton, and concrete. And not only that, which I wasn't even aware of, which really makes this ahead of its time, it was done in prefab sections. I had always just assumed that the concrete went up and then they'd pour, or the steel beams went up and they'd pour concrete around it and whatnot. But no, apparently it was prefab sections made off site and then put together on location, which for the 1930s, that would really put that ahead of its time because, you know, you tend to think of prefab only from the 60s or 70s on, certainly not back in the 30s. So in our little bit of a research, we find no mention whatsoever of bricks being used in the construction of the Empire State Building. That's number one. Well, you know, the one that I thought was really interesting this week was actually the mint considering using donut-shaped coins because I actually got to go at the, to the Shanghai Museum while I was in China, and they had these awesome collections. People had donated their private collections of coins, and, you know, because this area of China is super old, they actually had coins from, like, Genghis Khan. They had coins from the Roman Empire. I mean, they had money from all eras, from way early B.C., and a lot of them were donut-shaped. They actually had some that were knife-shaped because you don't go anywhere without a weapon. So they actually went through a phase where they had knife-shaped coins, which actually had a little donut at the bottom, which I thought was interesting. And, uh, and then donut-shaped coins really up until modern money. So I'm not surprised at all that the Mint once considered using them. I am surprised I didn't know about it until I was 31 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently even a little in more recent history, there was still talk about it at some point. The red line of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, the T in Boston, the public transit system, the red line just this weekend celebrated its 100th anniversary. The green line celebrated it last year. The, the Green Line, which is the trolley system, was the first subway in America. The Red Line came a little bit afterwards, like a year later, uh, you know, it's in, in its initial section. But anyway, the Red Line just celebrated its 100th anniversary. In articles that I was reading about it, they showed several pictures of over the, the past 100 years. And they showed one back in the early 80s of some maintenance workers changing over turnstiles to a new type of token that was going to be used. Now, since then, in the past five years or so, even tokens have been phased out. They're being replaced by smart cards. But in the early 80s, they were changing the style of tokens. And they were getting away from coins. You were still able to drop coins in as opposed to tokens only. So there was this conversion process going on. And there was talk at the time that the tokens, which if anybody has used tokens while they still existed in mass transit systems, they kind of look like... <laughs> they kind of look like a nickel or something, you know. Oh, the ones we had in New York actually were donut-shaped. Yeah, so I, I was going to say, that that was and my story. And why so, uh, cut out the whole so, bit of that? Well, yeah, no, but this this is about the donut. 
they were using coins, and then most of these tokens were all also round, like coins. Well, the MBTA at the time, in the early 80s, said, well, we, we really have to consider what kind of turnstiles we're going to put in here and what kind of mechanisms, because the government is thinking about issuing some kind of donut-shaped coins, and then all of these tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, whatever it would be, an expense that it cost in the 80s to turn over to turnstiles, they would immediately become obsolete because their turnstiles wouldn't accept these new donut-shaped coins. So apparently the Mint was even considering donut-shaped coins as late as the 1980s. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't realize it was as late as the 1980s. That's interesting. It's, yeah. also, a good way, it's also a good way to prevent slugs and things like that being used in the system. Yeah. So, uh, so have you ever actually seen a crocodile tooth, Fred? I've seen that. Uh, that crocodiles do grow new teeth as, as they lose them. Unlike we, we only have two sets, crocodiles have four and five sets of teeth, and as they lose them, they grow new ones. It's just part of, part of their physiology. It's a big word for you. Very impressive. So, I guess I didn't know about the. Did I, did anybody hear about the sentence that I seem to remember, like in childhood, them saying? the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog used every letter of the alphabet but i've never tested the theory yeah i i remember that vaguely from typing class in high school and i say vaguely because i learned how to type before high school i was lucky enough my mother was a secretary and in data processing and everything and this, this is just a great story she turned out to be a prophet or a prophetess or whatever a female prophet would be called back when i was in elementary school she she took out this old clunky old mechanical typewriter and she said you're going to learn how to type and of course as a boy especially in the 1960s i had no interest in learning how to type that's a girly thing i wasn't going to be a secretary what do i need to know that for and she said, in your lifetime, it's going to be all about typing. It's going to be computers, because remember, she worked in data processing in its early stages of existence. And she said, in your lifetime, it's going to revolve around computers and typing and so on and so forth. And she made me learn how to type at a very early age. So when I had to take a, take a typing class in high school, I had already known how to type, and I aced it and really didn't even need to pay attention. But I remember in the book that we had for typing, or that everybody else had to use to learn how to type and to memorize the keys, I didn't remember it now until this week when we were going over to Lobster Tales. But as soon as I saw that, I said, oh yeah, geez, I remember that now. That was in this textbook. The, that, that was actually a sentence that you had to type because it used all of the letters. Wow, that explains a lot of, that story explains a lot about you, Ed. Well, that's okay. I learned how to type when I was young, too. Same for the same basic reason. My father was involved with the uh, old Univac computers years and years and years and tens of thousands of years ago. The idea that the keyboard, when they had these computers, everything was put into teletype machines with the, you know, the, the original QWERTY keyboards. And I, and I remember being at my father's office, and he would have a typewriter, and he typed all his reports. And I learned how to type that way, and it came in handy in the military. We had to type reports and, lo and copy over log sheets, so it, becomes, it does become handy. And it's an important skill because now, especially with the QWERTY keyboard on, tel on, on our smartphones and Blackberries and, and computers are all keyboard now. You know, it, it's important to learn this stuff, and it, it's it's an it's a good skill anyway, just to have. An, you know, it's amazing how things evolved, though, because at the same token, with everything going touch screen now, yes, it, it's still a keyboard on a touch screen. But it's not the same as typing on a physical keyboard, uh, and I mean a large touchscreen. I mean even on, like I think you were saying, Fred, you got for your steps on the uh, new uh, computer with the uh, touchscreen yeah, monitor and all. So now, you know, you're looking at a, I'm not talking a smartphone, I'm talking a full screen monitor that's a touchscreen. It's still different, but it's still different than a mechanical keyboard. So, you know, with voice becoming so popular and prevalent now, you know, you have... Apple Siri, which I happen to not be a fan of, I'm a big fan of Vlingo, which is a company out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, which has just been bought out by another bigger company, so I don't even know if they're going to be based in Cambridge anymore, but Vlingo, Siri, any of those that you could use on any smartphones, whether it's, I guess this is our tech segment of the week, so welcome <laughs> to our tech segment of the week. You could use it on an iPhone, an Android phone, a Windows Phone 7. It's available for all of the formats, even BlackBerry. 
can't leave them out yet. The lingo you could do and theory to a lesser extent. The lingo was actually a lot more involved. You could do anything with it. You could send emails and text messages. You could open and use applications. You could post post to Facebook and Twitter. If you have a blog with WordPress, you could update your blog with it. You could do absolutely everything by voice. And now that this voice recognition technology is getting more and more accurate, and it's extremely accurate, especially if you're in a quiet environment. If you're in a quiet environment, it's virtually 100% accurate. As you get into noisier in environments, then of course the quality goes down, or the accuracy goes down. But now with voice being so prevalent, even touch screens are less important. Myself, for example, I do very little typing on my smartphone. I use Lingo for everything, uh, unless, unless I'm not in a quiet environment where it's more trouble than what it's worth, obviously, because then you have to go back and correct everything anyway, so you might as well have just typed in the first place. But if well, I'm in a quiet environment, I'll use voice dictation. Well, what do you think, Fred, about the naysayers who kind of say, like, yeah, it's it's great that you can do voice commands under certain, as you said, certain environments. I don't want to. The whole thing that's great about having a having a keypad is that you're it's privacy. You know, you're not the nut. Oh, no, no, absolutely. I'm I'm not to cut in on Fred because you asked the question to Fred. But oh, I'm absolutely. I'm not. I'm not talking about when I'm in public or anything. I always use. I matter of fact, not only do I only use typing when I'm in public to use send an email or a text or anything else. When I'm on public transportation, be it a train, a bus, anything like that, I don't even answer my phone. I will not get involved in a voice conversation while I'm on public transportation. One of my big pet peeves are these people that have their private conversations, uh, they're airing out their private conversations like a clothesline, remember those people, on public transportation. I don't want to hear this conversation. Nobody else on this stinking bus or train wants to hear your conversation. Thank Even you. if it is only something about, like, what are we having for dinner? This could have been done by private text or email. It didn't need to be done by voice. But that being said, when I'm in public, I don't even like to have a voice conversation. I'll revert to text or email or something. Uh, and we, yeah, and we do that a lot. I mean, you got to understand, people have to understand, during the day, between the base and offices, between private conversations, and I'll text almost all day long. I use Vlingo on my smartphone uh, attached to my Bluetooth because in Pennsylvania, texting's still legal. It allows me the opportunity, and it, it automatically sets up my Bluetooth. I hit the button, it asks me, what do you want to do? I can make a call to my contact list, I can send a text to my contact list and an email to my contact list from the car while I'm driving hands-free. And it avoids a $50 ticket in Pennsylvania, which they're thinking about raising to $100. So, you know, it's a good idea. And I'm not, again, we're not touting Vlingo as a not sponsor. Yet, not yet, not until they're a sponsor. Once they're right. a sponsor, then we'll talk and about them all using, we want. If you're using Siri, if you're using anything else, you know, and it works for you, that's fine. But what happens is that we happen to use Vlingo at BaseNet because we happen to happen to like it, and, it, and you know we do endorse it within the company. But it's you know the I, I had a text message my wife on the way home. I text message from the car, got on, put it, said you know text message, and it sent the text message what I said right from the car. And the only problem is a car is not a quiet environment. Most vehicles aren't because you have the rumbling, so you're not gonna you may not get a hundred percent text. You know, go back in, retext it again, speak slowly, enunciate, and you should be fine. But again, with the laws that are coming out now, especially, again, like you said, I'm, I'm tired of hearing people's conversation. It was worse when you had the old Nextel chirp. Uh, click. The, and the, it the would chirp, chirp constantly, right? And our biggest complaint was that the, fo the phone defaulted to the outside speaker rather than defaulting to the inside speaker. Remember those days? I used mm -hmm. to say that. Yeah. And you had to put it on the inside speaker. I don't want to hear both sides of your conversation. Never, I don't want to hear one side of it. Text if you can. You know, and for God's sake, people, go out and buy a Bluetooth for your phone. Do not drive down the road with your with your phone stuck to your ear. They, you know, I'm getting tired of seeing that in states, especially where it's illegal. But that's my safety message for today. But what can I tell you? Yeah, and if you don't have the money to go out and buy a Bluetooth, because good high quality Bluetooths will still cost you a hundred dollars. The cheap ones really are that. They're cheap. They're garbage, and they don't work half the time. If you don't have the money to spend for a decent Bluetooth, every single phone that's on the market today comes with a hardwired headset. So just stick the earbud in your ear 
and use the hardwired headset at least. It's still hands-free and you're still legal at that point. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's, uh, those are all very interesting. Um, and I, I appreciate your insight on stuff like this, Ed, because I think sometimes, I don't know, I think sometimes we don't think about it in those terms. You know, I think sometimes with technology, people don't think about, is this something we actually need? Is it practical? Is it something we actually want? And I think it's interesting to think, you know, kids today start off texting and typing. That's how they communicate with their friends, much more than we used to yell or ride a bike over to somebody's house. You know, they rarely ever have need for that anymore. Sure, and that's the reason I bring up voice recognition technology is it's becoming more and more popular. I know somebody through someone else, um, you know, I'm third person in this conversation. This party, who's a younger fellow, a college-age kid, he lives with Flingo. It happens to be Flingo. He mentions it, so I'll mention the name again. He does absolutely everything by voice recognition with Lingo. He never touches the keypad of his phone. This is a college age kid. So you can see the direction it's going. Yeah, definitely. And while we're on uh, tech stuff, uh, did you want to talk about NASA, Fred? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. Hey, did you guys see the update that I sent about uh, Fred's neuron, uh, neutrinos? <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just, I just found that it was ironic after we had discussed it, or Fred had discussed it last week, and I was saying how you know, I had heard about a couple of other researchers now disputing it and finding out that, in fact, neutrinos don't travel the speed of light disputing old, uh, what's his name's theory, Einstein. And lo and behold, uh, in the paper like last Tuesday or something, was that article that I forwarded to you guys. Oh, that, that was interesting. I just, I just have to say for the listeners at home, I wish you could see the email that Ed sent because it's literally like a ripped out piece of the Metro and he took a photo of it. <laughs> no, I scanned it. It was scanned on my that scanner. That's so old school. I love it. So I just wanted to share that that was. Hey, happening. I have a scanner, so why not use it? He's we, actually, we actually got to read the paper. Make news, free newspapers, high technology. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. it was and, well, that's true. I never read newspapers. As a matter of fact, well, you know, I shouldn't say I don't read newspapers. I subscribe to the digital subscription of the New York Times. So I read yeah. the New York Times every day religiously, and then I'll read. A dozen other newspapers online, uh, non-subscription, you know, they're free formats, but I do subscribe to the Times. But the Metro, for those of you who don't know, it's in at least Boston, New York, and I believe Philadelphia, and probably some other cities. It's a free newspaper that's given out on public transit. And this, and it's it's great. A regular newspaper. It, it covers it all kinds of topics. It yeah. up all the AP and Reuters news. E and exactly. Puts it in, you know, easy, quick, on your way headlines. I yep. love it. So that. that's where I happen to have gotten this. So I said, well, since we had just discussed this, time to rip it out and I'll scan it and I'll send it to everybody. That was a great article. That was a great, great, great article. Well, I but, love that it ended up being a faulty cabling issue. Like they thought that they thought that uh, <laughs> because of a faulty cable. <laughs> yep, blame it on technology. Anyway, getting back to texting, uh, NASA is considering <laughs> using texting to communicate with astronauts on future missions to Mars. They're considering using the International Space Station also to practice for a trip to Mars. Because of the speed of texting, which is faster than voice, apparently, it takes about 22 minutes. Or it takes up to 20 minutes for a message to get from one area to another. Texting takes almost no time. So they want to so they, they want to practice using text messaging to communicate with astronauts on future missions to Mars. I think that's great. Let me but see a guy with a smartphone texting himself, you know, listen, well, we're coming in for a landing. Oh, okay, you know, it, that's great. Well, the, on, the only sad part about a future mission to Mars, it looks like unless we get Newt Gingrich in his president and folks you're going to have to listen to this week's viewpoint because after you listen to this week's viewpoint you'll oh, see that well how could i say i don't think that most people would assume either myself or tony mazuko are going to be voting for newt gingrich for president well, hey. but that being okay. said <laughs> um unless newt gingrich who is all for the space program gets elected president i don't think there's going to be much future in our space program anyway well, I'm Nobody really excited about this on. texting technology because now everyone in space can be as bored with people talking about how they've eaten a sandwich or 
gone to a nightclub or arrived at the Hunger Games screening, you know, on a second by second basis, just like the rest of us. It's but you know, texting is basically the precursor to Twitter. You have a limited amount of space to share stuff that uh, you really don't want to waste a phone call on. Well, there's also something else. And remember that in certain areas of the country, like where I'm at now, you have and because I live on the back of a mountain, so I get my cell service is, is very good. It's better now than it was, but it's sporadic sometimes at best. I there are times I can't get voice through, but I can get texting through. Because it takes less, I guess, bandwidth for a text or whatever the situation is. So it, that makes a lot of sense for them to do that. I mean, and, and the fact that NASA is doing it now seems to me, it, it seems that this is something they should have done 20 years ago. You know, I mean, who knew texting was going to be so popular? And, they, and I guess the, the, the delay wasn't that bad until they started thinking about going to Mars. Well, if they go to Mars and they're texting, I think that those are both cool things. But I do wonder, I do wonder, like, I, I do think the burden of proof still falls on NASA to say why they want to do it. You know, it is important. I do support space travel. But how hard is it to make a case for this? And well, why, yeah. well they do. They do because they say that, that depending upon more on Mars's and what they say, you know, the, the distance and where it's location in its orbit to Earth, a voice message can take anywhere from three to twenty-two minutes. And if there's a problem. That twenty, that nineteen-minute gap can, it, you know, you're saying we're having a problem, an oxygen problem, and twenty-two minutes later it reaches Earth and it takes another twenty-two minutes to get back. That's no, it's, 45 not, minutes. it's not the texting that is my problem. It's like Ed said. The, you know, the reason that the space program was basically put on hold or suspended is because they have not been able to show why a trip to Mars would be financially plausible and something really important for our country. Oh, okay. No, I, th I, thought you, I thought you meant texting, that's all. No, I just think that they're I being apologize. lazy about it. I just think, I don't know, I think that they could make a case and they're not really trying. But that's neither here nor there. What do I know? I don't work for NASA. So maybe we'll get into something I know a little bit better here. We can uh, talk a little bit about the Hunger Games, long awaited, finally. Yeah, how, how do we justify that? Well, if we if we want to make it, yeah. How do we justify that? We justify one hundred million dollars. How we justify it? Dollars domestically and two hundred and fourteen million worldwide. But if you really want the big blockbuster of this weekend, it's that Ed actually enjoyed it and is going to go see the whole thing, even though he gets to watch bits and pieces of it at work. That's the point. Yeah, really, really good. Like I said, I um, have watched bits and pieces of it enough to start putting two and two together, and I have to admit I catch myself peeking in on it a lot more than I do on other movies and as opposed to just watching the bits and pieces at some point I'm going to sit down and watch the whole thing it looks it looks interesting well you know some people what's interesting about the Hunger Games as opposed to a lot of there are a lot of differences between it and the other young adult novels that have come sort of had a moment lately you know between the Harry Potters and the Twilights and everybody's talking about it and we all know that is that The Hunger Games is post-apocalyptic, it's violent, it's bloody, it's honest, it's very, there's a wartime theme to it. You have a female lead. My who's kid's not, gonna love it. Yeah, well, you have a wartime lead who is not, uh, she's a female, and she's not your typical floundering, flouncy-haired, sort of curious. No, it, almost a plain Jane character. Exactly, and she and she is very... She, you see both parts in how she takes control of the decisions that she can make and how she makes decisions. And then you also see that, that some of the things are out of her hands, which I think is typically ignored in wartime films. They sort of make it look like, you know, there are decisions that are made for you that don't affect your story. But in her story, a lot of decisions that other people make directly affect what happens to her and who she becomes. And I think that's so much more like real life. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I read the series. I enjoyed the series, but I thought to myself, this isn't one I'm going to read multiple times. Because it's actually, it's realistic to the point to me, and I don't want to spoiler it for anyone. So spoiler alert, if you're out there and you haven't read the series. But to me, it winds up in a way that's very realistic and not very fairy tale. There's no real happy ending. It's, it's very complex. And I think that is something very appealing. And it makes the movies much more interesting. Well, again, spoiler alert. Not that I could uh, spoil anything anyway, not having watched it. But I'm just <laughs> going to jump to the end. I, I tend to watch end of movies more than I watch any other part of movies. And it just from what I've seen, it obviously leads to the sequel. Absolutely. And, uh, and the two, I found it interesting that people, when we walked out of the theater, my husband said, 
Are there more? There are more, right? And I think it's so funny. Here's... Yeah, it leaves you hanging. You, you want more. Oh, exactly. And I think and it's that's so the funny. point behind making a movie is they're going to come back for more and more and more and more and more. I mean, you know, what, 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 you know, you talk about the female character. If you go back into the Terminator picture, the original Terminator picture with the character where she becomes the warrior to fight the future Terminator to what's coming. Linda Hamilton? Her, yeah, Linda yeah. Hamilton. When, you, when she changes from the girl who has no idea, in almost self-trained with the T-shirt on, the gun, I mean, she becomes that person, and it's a change in her. And it's a, it's a refreshing character to see that because there are women like my wife who, if, you, if, if something happened to her family, she'd become that character and go after people with vengeance. There'd be no stopping her. That's realistic. That's realism. People need to see. And, you know, the fact that the movie may or may not end with a happy ending, well, life doesn't always end with a happy ending. I mean, it isn't all, you know, roses and glitter. You know, sometimes things happen where you have to sit there and think, well, what's going on next? I'm happy that that's that something like that because I may go out and see this movie now. Well, and I think it, this movie is especially poignant for the reason you said, Fred, about the roses and glitter. I think it also, in this day and age, when we're in the middle of a recession, it examines the cost of the roses and glitter to the rest of the population and sort of what that means for everyone. It, it definitely highlights the difference between the excess of some and the cost to others. And I, I think I think it'll be interesting and I think I think anybody who sees it can find a parallel that suits them. You know, people are comparing it to Star Wars and they're saying, oh, she's Luke. And I actually don't agree with that. I think if there are any comparisons with Star Wars, I'd pick completely different characters to be different people than what people have said. But I think a good comparison to Star Wars is the world is complex and that people are sometimes placed in a position where they have to make difficult decisions and, you know, an adventure ensues. <laughs> you know, from, from just seeing the bits and pieces of the Hunger Games that I've seen, I would compare that lead character or that lead female lead to uh, Linda Hamilton, as Fred was saying. That's why it shows. I think that's that a character. similar kind of character. Because she has to make those difficult decisions as to what she's going to do. You know, is she going to believe the character? Is she, so, and, and not to not to spoil Hunger Games versus Terminator, Terminator Two, whatever situation is. We all know they're completely different things. But the characterization of what Linda Hamilton's character has to do to to ultimately save herself and her son, try and save the future of humanity. You know, what I liked about that series, we find out through the, the last movie that no matter what you do, this was going to happen. All they did, they didn't even delay that Skynet still became self-aware and things still happened. So no matter, so through the entire movie, there was, it, it was great. I mean, I read a, a trilogy of, uh, of, of, of sci-fi books by a guy named James Hogan, where he, in two books, he builds up a theory and tears it down in the last book, and I thought that was an excellent idea. Uh, excellent idea. So I like those kind of stories. So I think I'm going to like the Hunger Games when I see it. I think so, especially if you like the outside forces that affect the character, because I think also she's she's flawed inherently, which I always love that in literature. I think we've talked about Game of Thrones on here before, and I love fiction where the leading characters are inherently a little flawed. You know, it's one of the beautiful things that Tolkien did. You can look back in history. Most of the best literature has seriously flawed heroines or heroes, and she's flawed. And a lot of the things that make her progressions go the way they are is that the people who have surrounded her have sort of filled in her gaps for her. And I, I just, I think it'll be interesting. I'd love to hear what you guys think when you see it. But yeah, so that, I, you know, I know this is a big story and that everybody's talking about, we usually kind of dodge this, but I think that this one's worth talking about because I think it's, it's truly different than a lot of the other movies that have been released. And before and, we move away from our Who Cares entertainment segment, oh, in two weeks... This one I care. In two weeks, uh, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of Titanic. And... I anticipate on that show two weeks from today, we'll discuss not only the movie, let's go back and take a look at the most recent movie from the 1990s, James Cameron's Titanic, because it's being released in conjunction with this 100th anniversary now in 3D, it's being re-released in 3D and IMAX and all. Uh, so we could talk some about the Titanic movie from the 90s, we could go back and talk about what I think is the best Titanic movie from uh, 1957, and then talk about the anniversary itself, 
it's it's real news it's news that people don't cover i think we're going to see a certain amount of coverage for the 100th anniversary of titanic's disaster but i i don't know again that mainstream media is really going to be all over it i think that we have a good venue to discuss the 100th anniversary well the titanic has, has spawned a lot of film it also spawned one stage play if you remember the unsinkable yeah. molly brown's about well, the more, survivors more more than the that there was also a titanic stage play as well right, right. Yeah, but that was based on the ship on uh, part of the thing but the uh, a offshoot so to speak being the unsinkable molly brown about molly brown how she takes over one of the rescue boats and brings them into so it's it it takes place on that, but and and what people have to understand about the tit- about the Titanic, and we don't want to get into the show at this point. The because of the sinking of Titanic, a lot of a lot of the international laws were changed. Certain organizations were created. Certain items were created. Certain monitoring was created. Find out about. That. I'll tell you about what I know about that in two weeks when we do the anniversary special or the anniversary show. Well, I guess my last my last bit of entertainment news to share with you guys today, and mostly I just wanted to talk about this from the standpoint of do we think it is or don't we? Apparently, there have been some allegations that Sherry Shepard was quote unquote cheating because she took some dance lessons before getting ready. Okay, to- Fred, can I say it this week? Go ahead. Who cares? Oh, well, it's- both care when I brought this story forward because I think I would like to hear what Fred what Fred has to say on this because I think he has a very good point. I mean, too too bad Gene's not with us this week. You and Gene right. could have had your segment. Well, yeah. the thing is, like Holly said, there's a, the people are allegations she cheated not for nothing, but these people are on an audience with what 30, 40 million people watching. A lot of these people, like myself, or and I don't know what about, about your situation, Holly, but. I haven't danced real ballroom dancing in over 35 years. <laughs> and for me to go, well, you're only 31, but I'm saying, but I haven't danced in over 35 years. I mean, real ballroom dancing. I mean, I was 20 years old the last time I did this. And if I was pick, if I was to go on Dancing with the Stars or even Dancing with my wife, for Christ's sake, I'd go out and take some lessons and make sure that I'm, I'm at least – partially schooled on what's going on. I mean, any, especially these people when they're trying to win a contest or even if the money goes to charity or goes to them or what the situation is, these people are out there. Not, they're not trying to make fools of themselves. They get time to practice. They get time to, to learn what's going on. But anybody in that position or myself or Holly or Ed or anybody, if you would do something like this without taking lessons, it would be foolish. And I don't think that's cheating. I think it's, enha- it's enhancing your, your knowledge and getting back into the practice of what you may or what do you do if you've never learned if you've never seen ballroom dancing going out and taking lessons is a good way to learn so that you're at least halfway proficient before you walk in there hey i, I think i to, just i don't want to look like an idiot or you know, look like an ass on, on tv i think i just came up with baseness next big huge hit and it could also be potentially our biggest money maker you guys sitting down oh yeah oh you know, of course we're sitting down we're in the studios dancing with the lobster <laughs> Oh, no. What do you think, Larry? Could you dance? So good. Uh, First episode, we'll fly you out to St. Louis and we could have Holly and the Lobster dance uh, as the first episode of Dancing with the Lobster. uh, Let me see, but the only thing you could probably do is... The twist. I could picture the lobster doing the the twist. (laughs) No, (laughs) the twist. about The about the only thing I could do that I've seen several times... Davy Jones does this little bit. I'm not sure if you call it a dance. Not anymore, he doesn't. Not anymore, well, really. But the, oh, yeah. But in the video for the song Daydream Believer, he does this. He has a little step. He has his feet out at an angle, and he's kind of walking backwards, and then he kind of you know, will walk forwards again. That's probably about the closest that I could get. Okay, so, so that true. being said, I think we have a hit on our hands here, Dancing with the Lobster. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think it'd be a big hit. I do. But that said, I, I do I do agree with you, Fred. I was on I was on quote unquote national TV though I wager maybe three people saw it. It's on a TV show called I Wanna Look Like a High School Cheerleader Again. And they told us basically the day we got there it was a weight loss show. We were not made aware of that when we applied. And I was so nervous about being on TV. I actually lost ten pounds before I went on the show. I might could have won oh, that's, it if I hadn't done that's that. cheating. That's cheating. Right there, you go. But I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I just couldn't. I just couldn't eat. I was like, I, I just, you not that I couldn't eat, but I didn't want to look fat on TV. And that's part of the thing. These people, 
a lot of these people careers and other things, be it football, baseball, whatever they do as celebrities, they don't want two and a half or 20 million people looking at them going, what an asshole this guy is. I mean, what an idiot. You know, oh, God, the guy's on this TV and he can't even dance. Well, of course, if you, know, if you haven't danced in 25 years, you're going to go out and you're going to take lessons. Anybody who wouldn't is foolish. And Absolutely. I sub- completely support this woman. I the people that the people who are saying she's cheating are people who didn't take lessons and lost and said, you know, I should have done that myself, but we're going to accuse her of cheating. So you know something? I got. I don't even want to hear it. I mean, also, you know, and this is super important. If you've watched previous seasons, which I know you two have not, but you know Jennifer Grey was on Dancing with the Stars. She was in the movie Dirty Dancing. Her father is Joel Grey. She grew up dancing. You know, a lot of the people who have won this show. She, she won, not, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yes, and maybe Heinz Ward aside, a lot of the or Jerry Rice maybe, but a lot of the people who have won the show are people who have had previous experience dancing in their careers for payment. So, yeah, it's not fair for the people who come in and have never danced before. And she's up against a guy who's a professional hip-hop dancer. I mean, a lot of these people have danced in other contexts of their lives. And so what? She took a couple dance lessons. She wanted to be prepared. She's already at a disadvantage. I see nothing wrong with that. Otherwise, they would never be able to allow any actor who had previous dance experience. Also, the thing is that, that, you know, I don't like... You know, I did the kind of contest where the first guy comes out and he's so far ahead of the rest of the pack that he automatically was. I want to see people get a run for their money. And if this girl take, and again, I haven't seen the show, but if this girl taking lessons gives the professional hip hop dancer a run for his money, well, it makes it more entertaining for those people that are watching it. It gives you somebody to root for the underdog. They're not out of the first show. Anything you can, because you know, you got to know that they, that this hip hop dancer, he took lessons. It may have been years ago, but he took lessons. Somebody taught him what to do. A choreographer did something. Somebody taught him what was going on. And so you can say he cheated too. I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm with you, and that's exactly how I feel about it. So I guess that's the end of our Who Cares segment, and I guess that's how much we care about that particular issue. And I guess that would be, do we have a, is that it for today? I'm so no, old bit, no old bits today. I think that might just about be it. Wow, that that's amazing. So, you know, guys, I enjoy talking to you every week. and Pretty good. This was a good show for number 35. Let's uh, before we close up. Let's remind everybody where to find us. You can find us at basenettv.com. And remember, we are starting a special as of this week, special charity that we're involved with. Anybody that has watched Basenet programming for the past three years knows that over the past three years we have covered numerous Jimmy Fund events for Dana Farber Yay, Dana Cancer Farber. Institute with Holly has certainly hosted a couple of those specials for us. If you go to basenettv.com and our donation link up at the top where you could donate to help support programming of Basenet, between now and June 1st, anybody that donates to Basenet TV, Basenet TV will turn around and donate 20% to the Jimmy Fund at this year's Scooper Bowl in Boston, Massachusetts, the first week of June. Please donate to BaseNet. You'll help support our programming and keep us on the air. And 20% of all donations that we receive between now and June 1st are going to be presented to the Jimmy Fund at the Scooper Bowl in the first week of June. So you could do that at BaseNetTV.com. Click on the Donations tab and also, you could donate as little as a dollar. There is no particular dollar amount either for this. You know, we'll donate the 20% of the dollar. I'm sure the Jimmy Fund would appreciate it just as much as we do. We're not, yeah, we'd like the million dollar sponsor, but anybody that wants to give us a dollar, we'll gladly give 20% of that dollar to the Jimmy Fund as well. So please keep us and them in mind for that. Okay, listen, uh, for people that don't know it, we might want to explain what the Jimmy Fund is and what it's all about. I know Holly did some interviews with that in a couple of years, so we'll turn it over to you. Uh, Yeah, and actually my husband worked at Dana-Farber while we were in Boston, and the Jimmy Fund is basically the cancer research support for the for Dana Farber. When you donate to the Jimmy Fund, all of your money goes to cancer research and care at Dana Farber Cancer Institute. And for those of you who don't know, Dana Farber is pretty much the premier cancer research institute in the world. Most of the most progressive, most successful as far as I'm 
I'm concerned. Obviously, I'm a little biased. Uh, care happens there at Dana Farber. They are top in the world. Finding the Cure was written about one of the doctors who works there. It is an excellent cause, and all of the money that you donate through the fund goes to Dana Farber and research and care there. So it's an excellent charity and very successful. They're a huge part of the Boston Marathon. They have the Jimmy Fun Walk. They, I mean, there are multiple chances to give in many different ways, and they're just a really great charity. Sure, and you can watch all of that coverage from all three, the Scooper Bowl, the Jimmy Fun Walk, the Boston Marathon. We cover all of that on BaseNet and have for the past three years. Uh, Holly, Jill Henley have all covered that. Go back and watch some of our old programming. So again, yes, please uh, help support BaseNet, and then through BaseNet, we'll help uh, support the Jimmy Fund. If you want to support the Jimmy Fund directly, just go to jimmyfund.org, Jimmy Fund, one, as in one word, .org, and uh, you could also donate directly on their website. Follow us at BaseNetTV.com. On social media, on Facebook, we're BaseNet. Google Plus, we're BaseNet TV. And on Twitter, we are BaseNet TV. Email us at awsi at BaseNetTV.com. And if nobody has anything else, I think that just about does it. In Boston, I'm Ed Jupin. From the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. And from St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. And Gene White, who couldn't be with us this week. Remember, thanks again for listening to As We See It. And join us again next week. Bye.